Hello and welcome to The Sim Hanger. My name's Mark, The Sim Hanger for all things flight sim related and today something special. We're in X-Plane 11.5 and taking a look at the de Havilland Canada Dash 2, more commonly known as the Beaver, recently released by Thranda. If you're into GA, if you like it low and slow and you like to get into those difficult to reach airports, this is for you. We're going to do a quick review of this exceptional aircraft and then do a test flight in VR. The attention to detail and realistic modeling in this aircraft just blows my mind. But this is not just eye candy. Using X-Plane's excellent flight model, this baby is a handful. There are many aircraft out there that are really good, but only very rarely is one exceptional. The Jetstream 41 for FSX, PMDG 737 and A2A's Connie for Prepared, and the Hot Start TBM 900 for X-Plane are a few that spring to mind. Thrandos Beaver joins that list in my opinion. Today we're in one of my favourite areas for challenging flights, the mountains of Idaho. And we're on the ground at Sulphur Creek. Scenery is default explained but I do have terraflora trees installed. Today is a two leg hop. We're heading to Johnson Creek and then on to Big Creek. Both airports nestled in deep valleys. Both ideal destinations for the Beaver. To access the menu and configuration options, there's a small arrow on the left hand side of the screen. Click that and the menu pops up. Under the general tab, a wide variety of options are available. You can convert the engine mode and the steering to be a simpler model, so it's a get up and go aircraft. Performance wise, have reflections on or off. Add an optional fuel tank. Let's just close the doors and we can protect the engine by putting a cover on. Thranda's attention to detail is clearly evident. There's also an option to get an animation of the radial engine. This will prove very useful getting the engine started. We'll cover that a bit later on. Under the miscellaneous tab, you can choose whether to have ordinary or tundra tires. It's tundras for me. Other options include mud flaps, skis, or bubble windows. There's a wide range of liveries included as standard. And if that's not good enough, there's an option to paint your own. But there's one very neat feature. For each livery, it determines the amount of dirt and scratches. And you can turn that up or down to suit. From dirty and scruffy to clean. The choice is yours. Not sure how many liveries are included, but it's more than a handful. And I'm guessing something to suit just about every taste. The livery that I've chosen for today, let's go back to that, it's the RDM livery. You can set all weights and fuel load and under the camera setting there's a number of preset views for pre-flight inspection. Audio options are included as well as a slew mode which is excellent. Position your aircraft anywhere. Under the panel options you can reconfigure your dashboard or cockpit to suit your own taste as well as add in third-party gauges such as the GTN 750. A great feature. Let's just hide the yoke and we're going to run through a quick startup procedure. Master battery on and alternator on. Push the mixture lever fully forward and we'll just crank the throttle about half to three quarters of an inch. Excluding the optional belly tank, the Beaver has three fuel tanks. I'm going to choose the rear one as it's my fullest tank. Let's just raise the guard from the start switch and put mags to both. To make explanation simpler to follow, let's bring up the animation for the radial engine. Don't forget this is an old girl, last produced in 1967. So we're gonna need to prime the engine. Now finding that primer, it's just down by the pilot seat. A little difficult to find and to access. You can also prime it by just clicking on the animation. Lift the primer up, let it fill, and then push it back down. Looking at the engine animation, we can see how primed it is, and we're trying to get it into the green. That looks just perfect, but we're not quite done yet. We still have to manually pressurize the fuel line. Using the red lever, we raise it up and let it drop down. And we'll see that slowly but surely, the gauge registers an increase in pressure as we pressurize the lines. Normally takes four or five pumps of the lever to get the pressure between five and six PSI, which is ideally where you want it to start. Beacon light is on, prop is clear, let's start her up. In the animation we can see each cylinder firing away and we've got a good start. 
the sounds in this aircraft haven't been forgotten and are truly excellent. Listen to the Pratt & Whitney 450 horsepower motor grumble and growl away. Let's just shut down the engine for a moment. What happens if you've overprimed your engine and you're struggling to get it started? Here's a quick and simple way to do that. I'm just going to quickly overprime the engine. There we go, it's fully overprimed. In this state, using the realistic engine mode, try as we might, it is not going to start. Let's give it a go. As we crank the motor, the indicator on the animation is slowly moving towards the correct area but it won't get there. You either got to wait or reverse the over priming by doing this. Throttle to full and mixture all the way back. And now let's give that engine a crank. And we can see that the primer indicator comes back to just on the green, but that's where it'll stay. So to correct for that, we are just going to pull back our throttle slightly and raise the mixture slightly and try start again. And we're up and running in just a few seconds. We can now pull the mixture forward and reduce the throttle and we're ready to go. Welcome to VR and we're in the HP Reverb. By touching a panel on the left hand window support we can bring up the menu and change things in real time. Click on it to take it away. The pilot and co-pilots window can also be opened. Listen to this. My lights are set. Now handbrake off. And let's taxi get ready for takeoff. I'm just going to taxi to the end of the runway here and turn around ready for a takeoff to the north. The Beaver of course is a tail dragger and steering it takes a little bit of getting used to. Directional rudder with quite a lot of input on differential brakes makes it a whole lot easier. If you can, give yourself plenty of room to turn around in. Lined up and ready to go. Now pumping the handle just to bring the flaps down to the takeoff position. Just check they're coming down. There they go. All set, flaps to takeoff. I'm just going to trim a little bit of nose down as the beaver can tend to balloon and a little bit of right aileron on takeoff as she does tend to veer to the left. We're fairly high at 5,835 feet, so adjusting the mixture. Just checking I'm lined up, one of the many benefits of being in VR and now slowly pushing the throttle forward whilst also putting a bit of back pressure on the yoke. I want the wheels to lift off almost at the same time and I'm going to need less than 50 knots to do that. about 200 feet and immediately start pulling back on the flaps to the climb position. It's indicated on the panel there. You need to pull those flaps fairly quickly to reduce the risk of stall. Now bringing the nose down and letting the airspeed start to build. And I want a climb rate between 5 and 700 feet per minute. We need to get to something around 9,000 feet to clear the high ground on our way to Johnson Creek. I've also pulled the prop lever back, get it off maximum, and I've settled on about 2100 RPM. If I was at a lower altitude, I'd also have to be pulling back on the throttle and the manifold pressure. We're going to follow this valley for a little way whilst we climb altitude and then eventually hop over the high ground to our left. We've got two peaks to cover and then into a valley. We'll then have to start a fairly steep descent down to the airport. I won't retract my flaps until I'm at cruise. Clearing 
the first peak. We're just passing 8,100 feet and we're climbing on up to about 9,000 feet. I'm just going to turn and use this valley to help me gain some more altitude before hopping over the peak to our right. I've got our routes today plugged into the GTN 750 but it's hands-on flying all the way. No autopilot for me. I of course have never flown a beaver but it handles just the way I'd expect it to. You need to treat it right and respect it otherwise you can find yourself in trouble very quickly. We're over the second peak now, let's just test out some of the handling before we start our descent. First of all the ailerons, left and right roll. And now the rudder for the left and right yaw. The aircraft is immediately responsive and reacts as you would expect it to in terms of height and speed. You gotta keep your eye on her cause she does tend to have a nose up attitude and you can lose speed very very quickly. gradual descent since we cleared that second peak. Now at seven and a half thousand feet, Johnson Creek is at just below five thousand feet, so another two and a half thousand feet to go. Johnson's Creek is just at the end of this valley in front of us. We're following the river. For the descent to save wear and tear on the engine, I've pulled the RPM back to two thousand. This aircraft is ideally suited to flying in VR. It is in effect VR ready. And I'm flying in the Hewlett Packard Reverb, but it's not the G2 variant. It's the initial HP Reverb. I have it on pre-order with the new controllers, but I have been advised that delivery will not be before Christmas. I haven't tried the G2, but by all accounts it is definitely the headset to go for. I think in its price range it is definitely best in category, but I am likely to cancel my pre-order, and I'll tell you why. If I had any other headset other than the HP Reverb G1, I would not cancel. But the G2, although clearer and better with colors, is the same resolution. And the question I keep asking, is 700 pounds or nearly 700 pounds worth that upgrade? I'm not so sure. Still somewhat undecided, but I'm likely to cancel, to be honest. We're now approaching Johnson's Creek. Time to prep for landing. On the way down I've been progressively adding the flaps and using them almost as a speed brake. Flaps are now fully down, runway in sight, landing lights on and I want to cross the threshold at about 65 to 75 knots. Some high trees to clear on the initial approach and I'm hoping for a three point landing. Wish me luck. a three-point landing but fairly close I'm happy with that we've got plenty of runway so we're just gonna slow down turn around and taxi back as once again we're gonna be wanting to take off to the north and heading to our final destination Big Creek but for now welcome to Johnson Creek time to retract the flaps To get to Big Creek we're going to have to use the valleys to gain altitude, fly over one or two large peaks and then head down into a valley to prep for our landing. Big Creek is at 5,743 feet, high mountains all round and a little bit more of a challenge. Let's get on our way. We've got lots of runway here so I'm going to try a flaps up take off and then put the flaps down for climb. 
this really is a stall aircraft. Takes off on next to nothing, even with no flaps. Once again, we're going to be looking for something around 9,000 feet, heading in the general direction and following the valleys to climb to the altitude required. Flaps are now set to climb and my prop lever set to 2100 rpm. The weather has closed in a little bit and visibility has been reduced. It's far more misty than what it was before. Visibility is about 14 nautical miles. It's later in the day so we can't dilly dally. Sunset's about an hour away. Fortunately we have only got 15 miles to travel. We should be at Big Creek in plenty of time before dusk. And I've just changed fuel tanks over to rear. Not sure my front tank had enough in it. Keeping my landing lights on because of the reduced visibility. Canada Dash 2 is one of the all-time favourite bush planes. Initially produced in 1947 and was in production for 20 years and over 1600 have been made. And there's quite a few still up in the sky today, admittedly somewhat modified in most cases. clear and then we're going to be in the valley and we're going to have to descend fairly rapidly but we're not going to be able to get down in time so we'll fly a left hand traffic pattern and do a very steep and tight turn to turn back towards the runway for a final landing. Here's the final ridge in front of us and then it's into the valley we go. Big Creek is about six or seven miles in front of us. I'm at just over 9,000 feet, flaps are fully up and I'm set at cruise, but only just for a moment. I purchased this aircraft from the xplane.org store and the cost was just under 35 US dollars. And for a while I was undecided. But the guys at Thundra have done a magnificent job with this aircraft. To my mind, it's worth every penny. Well done, guys. This aircraft adds to the immersion, and flying in VR in this plane is a great experience. Big Creek dead ahead of us. We're going to join the left-hand pattern on the downwind leg and continue to reduce altitude as we go. And then, in effect, we're going to turn 180 degrees straight back to the runway. There's not much maneuvering room, so we're going to have to be careful. And again, I'm going to be searching for that elusive three-point landing. three-point landing but I'm very happy with that one. Pulling back on the yoke and gently applying brakes as we slow. While the Thundra DHC-2 Beaver gets my highest recommendation and especially so for VR. Thank you very much for joining Simhanger today. 
I hope you found this useful and entertaining. What do you think? Should I cancel my pre-order for the G2 already owning the G1? Is it value for money? I'd appreciate your views. Leave them in the comments below. Thank you. I'll catch you all again very soon. And until then, well, bye for now.